Um, welcome to this session which will explore um, pensions, freedom, uh, pensions freedoms and particularly communications angles. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by um, a very distinguished panel of, uh, of, you know, of contributors. Yes, you too, Peter. Um, so Anne Hunt, um, who is Pension and Risk Benefits Manager from Warburton's, uh, Jamie Johnson, Deputy Director from HM and Treasury Pension Wise, uh, Nikki Mortimer, Client Director from Capital Cranfield, Alex Roy, uh, Manager of Life and Pensions at the FCA, and Peter Shellswell, Director from First Actuarial. Um, we are being uh, streamed live on the web as well, um, and so if, in my great Davina voice, uh, no swearing, please, panellists or audience. <laughs> Um, so um, the reason I look very geeky with two iPads is I'm actually um, also monitoring questions that may well be uh, presented to us from people who are watching the live streaming as well. So uh, hopefully we'll have a, a, a rich um, exchange of views in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, and obviously we'll be inviting uh, questions from the floor if any of you want to uh, submit any questions uh, as well. So um, first off, um, in terms of a, a general question for everybody, really, um, what difference has the introduction of pensions freedoms meant to each one of you in your in your different capacities? We we'll start with you, Anne. Um, I think, from my perspective, obviously, a lot of unexpected work, you know. So, um, and also within within quite tight time frames as well. Not a lot of time to deliver it, um, and also thinking about the cost of delivering all of that and bringing that to the business. Um, within the time frames, but um, being um, optimistic like Mr. Haig, um, we managed to deliver all of that on time and you know we, we hit that goal for April. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Jamie. Uh, well, for me, uh, I got a new job, which was quite nice. Uh, <laughs> but um, for the Treasury, it meant standing up a national service uh, in a tight time frame that was going to deliver right across the country as well as over the phone uh, uh, with guidance uh, specialists who had never done this before. So making sure that we had appropriate trained people in the right place at the right time for our customers uh, and, and doing that quickly was, was definitely a challenge, but, but one that we rose to. So, yeah, it's been uh, great time for us. Fantastic. Nikki? Um, for trustees, it, it means more, more things to consider. So more choice, which is clearly a good thing for the, um, for the member, but more things as a trustee to consider um, from a governance perspective. So more work, um, but ultimately more work in service of a, a better outcome potentially for the member. So that's positive. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Alex, see you next. Uh, well, from an FCA perspective, I mean, I, I guess we are very concerned about you know, risk and, and consumers. Um, so for us, I think, you know, this, this massive move from sort of a, a world where people go to annuities and the F FCA and FSA beforehand, having spent many years making sure the regime ensures people have the right information, shop around, get the best value for money, suddenly people are making all different choices. So for us, you know, this has put a massive amount of work to try and make sure that, that we change our rules and make sure that people are pointed towards the sort of services that have been set up by the Treasury, are given risk warnings, and make sure that we get the right sort of communications them from firms. And, and that's a, it's been a hell of a challenge over the last year. Peter. Um, from a financial education point of view, um, two things. Really, there's been a spike in interest in, in pensions, which we've seen um, both in DB and DC. We've <coughs> First actuary, we, we run a lot of schemes and we've seen a spike in the number of transfer value requests. Um, and, and that's good from a financial education point of view because it really means it's uh, the challenge is always to try and get people's attention to get them interested in pensions and, and get them thinking about that. So that's been a, a positive. The, the kind of the challenge is that now there's so many new options to talk to people about. We've really had to think through how we can best explain those options uh, which are now available. And that actually uh, leads me to what I think is, is a great, great place to start, if I can start with you, and that is what more can we do to educate people about the freedoms? Because education seems to be a, a I think huge education issue. is key. I think, the, uh, for me, the, the starting point in one word is engagement. Um, it, we try so often as, a, as an industry, I think, to try and help people to understand this, but they're just not interested. Mm -hmm. So we need to work really hard on engagement, and that's about really drilling down to what are the key messages which, which we need to talk to people about. Um, and it always takes a, a, long, a lot longer to try and distill out mm -hmm. what the key messages are. I think it was Mark Twain who said, I think um, this quote's already been used in this conference, you know, I'm sorry I wrote a long letter, I didn't have time to write a short letter. 
it takes a while to really think through what those key messages are. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to make sure that we're using the right language. Um, uh, we, we spend quite a bit of time with uh, uh, word consultants, which is quite an in interesting concept for us. Um, but they, they, they picked us up so often and saying, you know, the words you're using, Peter, you're calling it a pension, a benefit, an income, an annuity. Please, it's not creative writing. It's technical, just use one word. So we need to use the words which, which mean most to the people. And I think we really need to improve design. I think I've seen some fantastic examples of some really well-designed communications, and that really does work. So... Engagement is key. Once people, I think, are, are interested and actually have the confidence that they can understand it, then they're ready to learn. So I, I think when it comes to communications, really working hard at that first piece on engagement is, is key. Great. Nikki, I was just going to say. Yeah, we had the CEO of Whitbread um, run one of the plenary sessions yesterday. I don't know when any, whether anybody was there. Mm -hmm. but. But the visual impact of the two communications that he put up on the screen, the old style, which was just a page full of words, and the new style with some fantastic graphics, and you could just immediately yourself, even though you know, we're experts in this field, um, you could immediately um, relate more, more closely to, to the one that was visually um, more pleasing to the eye, let alone what the words themselves said. Yeah. Um, and I think as an industry, we have historically just over fundamentally overestimated the knowledge base that people are starting from. Mm. And I think we have to just go back and assume they're starting from nothing yeah. and build the communication that way. And I think the other thing that, that, that excites me about the time that we're in now is we really are now seeing a convergence of administration and communications. Historically, they were done separate. Whereas now, through technology, and Sir Clive Woodward talked about <laughs> embracing technology and using technology, through technology, we really can be extremely effective with the education that, that needs to be built. And, and bringing admin and communication together to deliver that education is a, mm -hmm. is a fantastic opportunity that, that we should grasp. Okay, great. Um, being responsible for a, for a scheme, obviously, communication mm -hmm. is, is something that's very, yeah. very close yeah. to your heart. Yeah. How, how have you dealt with the, the challenges of freedoms um, with, with your, your members? Yeah, I mean, it, communications is very, very key to the work that we do. Um, we have a member engagement strategy across the whole pension piece, which is more around the kind of the pensions journey from joining the pension scheme to retirement. And we're developing segmented communications along that roadmap. I don't know if anyone attended the presentation last year, but I kind of showed that roadmap and what that, the framework of that looked like. Um, and obviously with the new freedoms, what we did do is focus on the at retirement piece. So what we did, we developed um, a set of communications, uh, a roadmap to retirement, which is a booklet for our employees. Um, and what we've tried to do is simplify the choices that they have within that booklet and within our um, pensions booklet as well. So we've gone for a simple A, B, C. A for annuity, B for bit by bit, which is a drawdown, and C for cash, and tried to simplify it in that way. Um, so that when we explain and take our employees through this, they soon kind of pick up um, <coughs> the, the language that we're using. And we've done some case studies within that booklet and examples of pot sizes and what kind of pot size you might have to go down different routes. Um, we're just going through a launch at the moment in terms of launching that into the business. Um, so that's taking place between November and March of this year and we've developed a presentation and with that presentation we've actually done interactive sessions because I think there's nothing worse than going into a room talking about perhaps a subject that you may not be all that interested in and it's death by PowerPoint. So ours is very much about the visuals, you know, like the, the, uh, the panel is saying, very much about those visuals, take out the words, simplify everything, and make the messages very clear and un easy to understand. So we've actually done an A1 of the roadmap where at the very beginning of the session we can take you know get everyone in a group round the table and they can just see where they are on that road map looking at those people five years out from retirement um, and we've also supported that when, when we get to the ABC and and start to talk about those choices then we've actually done a video clip of uh, three of the children of um, our team in the office 
and it's all about what they would do with their piggy bank, the money in the piggy bank. Um, I have to say, it is really, really good. And um, it kind of links in quite nicely with the choices. And interestingly, the three-year-old, we did a three-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a nine-year-old. Three-year-old, when asked what she would do with her money in the piggy bank, said, I would take it and put it in my other piggy bank. Mm -hmm. And um, the little boy who was seven said, I would go to Tesco and buy lots of sweets. And the other little girl of nine said, um, well, I would go to Toys R Us and buy a toy, but I wouldn't spend all my money because I might need to get something later. So quite nicely linking into those choices of, you know, A, B and C, and it will kind of lift that mood and lighten it and everyone will become more engaged. Great. <clears throat> Jamie, if I come to you, you, Anne, you, you mentioned uh, focusing on the at retirement mm -hmm. piece. Obviously, yeah. mm -hmm. a big thing for the whole yeah. industry is yeah. guidance mm -hmm. and delivery um, of guidance. Mm -hmm. um, where do we go next with guidance and where do you think we are currently and what, what's the next steps? So, I, I think what we've built with Pensionwise is actually quite a, a restrictive guidance session mm -hmm. for launch. Um, which essentially just educates customers on you know, these are your options and that's what we'll tell you in a guidance session. Um, I think uh, now that we've been running the service for six months, it's quite clear that that one size fits all approach doesn't fit everybody. Uh, and so we're doing an awful lot of work, particularly in our customer lab at the moment, to trial different ways of making sure people get to the right outcome, even if the, the input that we give them is slightly different. So um, I would definitely envisage that our guidance sessions will change in their format, uh, in their length, in some of the content, uh, so that we make a much uh, better assessment of where customers are coming to us from. Uh, designing the guidance in a more personalised way to get them to the right outcome. Uh, and that might mean for some customers that actually that's a, a more than a, a one-off engagement. Um, you know, we definitely see customers who are coming to us with absolutely no level of knowledge or education and, and need some support to go and find some stuff out before they're actually able mm -hmm. to come and engage with um, the, the content that they need to uh, to be able to make an informed next step. So uh, I, I think we're likely to see you know, a change to multiple appointments that, that are much more uh, tailored for, uh, for customers. Uh, and, and I think you know, the uh, Treasury's announced today about the, the move towards Bank of England bill for PensionWise to be um, the listed guidance provider for uh, the uh, secondary market in annuities. Uh, and say so I would envisage that you know, we, we will need to develop our content for, for new customer bases uh, for, for that kind of product where they're making a different decision at a different time it, with much higher risks and consequences. <laughs> Um, so I, I think you know, we'll, we'll need to adjust the way that, that we uh, engage with customers, p particularly for that piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, it's not like to be a one-size-fits-all because every customer in every circumstance will be different. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I think it will be a much more tailored offering. Mm -hmm. Great. Alex, what have been the main challenges for you in the, the first six months of free Pension well, Freedoms? I mean, I think you know, we, we've got to sort of look at Pension Freedoms alongside that sort of wider uh, automatic enrolment. So I mean, automatic enrolment effectively disengages the consumer up front by sort of automatically getting them into pensions. And so I think that, that puts a lot more onus on, on pension professionals to then re-engage consumers during the lifetime of their saving. I think if they get to that point when they're about to retire and suddenly they're presented with all the options having never thought about it, I think that, that's just too late. And I think there's this process of education that needs to take place much earlier. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's certainly in our work, what we, we've been certainly talking to a lot of other providers out there who've been developing their website uh, uh, evidence and, and, and tools and sort of games almost mm -hmm. to help engage people, to help get them start to think about that. And I think then that fits across some, some work recently we've been doing, looking at lifestyling and the extent to which, you know, the current pension environment lifestyles people into less risky assets in the sort of the 10, 15 years before they retire on, on the presumption they'll be moving to annuities. But actually, again, I think, you know, the industry needs to think again about how it's engaging to get consumers to actually think about what they're investing in and how that should change, given the decisions they're likely to make. And I think that's, that's very challenging for the industry. But I think only through that sort of engagement, only through the sort of getting people to think early, are we going to get people at that mm -hmm. position when they do start heading towards retirement or accessing yeah. their pension pot, that they're able to take these really difficult decisions. Yeah, yeah. Right. We did have um, a couple of questions submitted um, before the session. Um, is Khalid Iqbal in the room? 
No, you see, you did promise me he'd be here to present his question in person. <laughs> <laughs> However, so I will present it on his behalf. So um, Khalid, who's from Accenture, um, wanted to know what is being done to address the lack of knowledge that members have regarding the effect of the new freedoms and their long-term impact on individuals. So, Peter, would you like to... Uh, yeah, can I have a crack at that? Yeah. I think what's really interesting is um, who people go to for advice. Um, and... I'm always struck when I talk to people, you know, their employment history is their pension history. Mm. And actually, uh, people do put a good, good deal of trust in their employers. Uh, so I, th I think it is right that employers um, <laughs> feel that they should be able to talk to, talk to employees um, about pensions. And this, this big change, which Alex, you've just been talking about in sort of default strategies. Um, you know, honestly, talking to most, most staff uh, and, and members, they don't want to be involved in the, the pensions investment side of their pot. Um, a few do, but the vast majority don't. They just want to be in a default thing, so please do it for me. Um, but I think we do owe it to them to tell them what it is they're investing in, why they're investing in it, and some of the decisions which lie ahead. And I think employers yeah. are, are best placed mm -hmm. to, to do that. Um, obviously, you have the, the problem when, uh, you know, Going forward with auto-enrolment, people are going to have lots of pots in lots of different places. We've got the whole pot follow member debate as to, uh, you know, will that, will that take place or not? Um, and so you might have people with different pots with lots of different investment strategies. So the future is going to be complicated for people. Um, but I think the employers are stepping up to the plate uh, and wanting to engage with, uh, with their employees and talk them through what their investments are. Yes, we have to work out how to simplify the message. Um, but people are looking for a solution where they don't have to make investment decisions day by day. We had a big debate as sort of when DC pensions be, you know, really began to, to come onto the scene that in the DB world, all the advice went to, to the employer and the trustees because they were the ones who were carrying the risk. And then DC came along and we started talking about, well, now um, do we expect every individual to be their own chief investment officer? That's not going to happen. So simple solutions, I think, are, are definitely necessary. But employers are best place to talk to talk to staff about those um, those changes. <coughs> and Nikki, how about the role of trustees yeah. in that? I do agree with what you, everything you've just said. Um, and and certainly as trustees, we're having much more dialogue now with the employers um, around this. What I think is unfortunate is that quite often. The dialogue automatically jumps to, well, are we going to provide financial advice? Who's going to provide financial advice? Um, and who's going to fund it? And, and I have to say, I'm a firm believer in, if you look at the communication continuum from, from you know, paper-based communication um, right through to financial advice, if you take most people through that continuum, and it would include pension-wise, probably midway through that journey, before you get to the point of needing to provide financial advice, most people, properly educated, yeah. get to a point where they're actually ready to make a decision themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and therefore and it's pure validation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. I, I think we need to stop jumping to financial advice as the mm -hmm. right thing to do mm -hmm. and the thing that we should all be considering um, who's going to pay for because I think there's so much more that we can do for the majority of people to get them to a point where they're yeah. comfortable to make decisions and nobody's funding financial advice. Much better to use yeah. that money yeah. to fund that education process than, than, than financial yeah. advice. Yeah. Alex, do you, have a, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's worth noting that, um, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of what counts as advice as well. Mm. I mean, certainly, you know, you go around the hall here and you can speak to lots of people who are <coughs> developing focused advice models, sort of information models. You know, there's, there's TPAS out there that offers just a service where people can phone up and ask for help. So I think that there's lots of different services out there. As I mentioned earlier about the providers and the fact that the tools that they have available. I think there's a lot more available out there for, for people to help themselves. But I think they need help to understand where these sources of help are. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that's kind of requisite on the industry mm -hmm. to actually make sure that, that people have the right signposting. And certainly a lot of the work we've done in rules is about starting to look at how, how firms have to signpost and how they have to make sure that consumers have risks explained to them, are pointed in the direction of, of pension-wise <coughs> and other sources of help. Um, at the same time, and we're, we're working jointly with Treasury on a, on a review of financial advice. And the aim there is to try and look at ways of how we can get more people access to more affordable types of advice in ways that suit their needs. So I think you know that that's those sort of developments are things that we can have an ongoing. I, I guess you know I, I sort of echo some of, of, of Leslie Titcomb's comments earlier today. 
that you know education as a whole is, is, is somewhat of a bottomless pit unless we target it, mm -hmm. unless we make sure we're actually doing it in ways yeah. that we can really see where the value is delivered for consumers. Yeah. 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 And what do you consider PensionWise's primary sort of responsibility to be in this whole area? Of so, so I think we've definitely got a responsibility for making sure people are as, as best informed mm -hmm. to be able to make uh, the right decision in their next step and that is different for, for different individuals. Um, I think you know, from a Treasury point of view we're also carrying out a review of the guidance landscape to see uh, is there a way that we can make this clearer for customers. You know, We have uh, TPAS, uh, PensionWise, the Money Advice Service, Systems Advice Bureau, you know, there, mm -hmm. there's quite a lot of players, public players in this space uh, and you know, rightly we're asking the question now is that still right is there a better way for us to to manage this area to make it easier for customers to understand where to go next um, you know all of that stuff is not going to be quick mm. fix nor do we know the outcome of it yet so uh, I think we'll just have to w watch this space as to where we end up on it but um, I, you know I think we see very clearly our role uh, in terms of helping customers get get the information mm. they need and, and get to the right place for, for a decision next. Right. And what are you doing with your, your members particularly in, the, in that area? And have you seen yeah. behaviours change? Yeah, with those I members? mean, yes, we have certainly seen behaviours changed. I mean, obviously, once the new freedoms came in in April, um, the team got a lot more calls from people ask, wanting information, asking questions. Um, we got more requests for transfer values. Um, people in DC taking the benefits early. Um, not a massive amount of churn in terms of taking retirement uh, figures and, and, and taking their pensions from DC. We only had about 12 people in that period. And as we thought, um, most of them would probably go down the cash route because of the sheer size of the pots. Mm. We just had one person that took an annuity. But on the DB side, um, more requests for transfer values. So there's been um, about over a 30% increase in requests for DB transfers. We don't let those transfers ha happen without the individual taking advice. And even if they're taking advice, we tend to have that conversation with them as well. Um, a slight increase in, um, you know, possible um, kind of, um, you know, uh, claims where you know it may not be a bona fide transfer, yeah. so pension scams and that. So uh, we've got a couple of those that are under investigation. And um, are, you, are you finding that you say you've had a 30% increase in people mm. asking for transfer values? Yeah. Is that actually following that they're actually taking those transfers, no. or is it they're just no. after the information? No, they're just after the information. Okay. But you know, all of that kind of puts strains on admin teams. Mm. You know, yeah. I think admin teams within. Um, consultancy firms have been quite pushed in that period, okay. um, but it, you know it's quite interesting. Um, I think some of some of the kind of judgments that we made beforehand are actually materialising now. We can see that, but I think to get a full picture, we need to see that twelve-month period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So six months in, a bit early to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to open it to the floor if anybody has got any questions that they'd uh, <coughs> like to present to, to the panel. Obviously, different aspects of the, uh, the industry represented here. So does anybody have any particular questions they, uh, they want to ask? Yes, gentlemen at the front. We do have a microphone. You just hang on for, uh, for a moment. Thank you. 100%. My name is Malcolm Issa Makumi from Croydon Council. A big percentage of our members when pension fund, they've got a DP scheme, which is kicking in life. But when they come to retire, they say she want to inquire about anything, say, come to us nine months before the retirement, then tell you how much you're supposed, supposed to get. And then they had to talk about the new freedom, whereby you can transfer money into another fund. Yeah. And what are they short for into the, the schemes? And had to talk about the conversion rate. Is there any way where people can know what the conversion if you are converting from DB to DC is? Is there any way that to is this something on about conversion rates? So is it something that's communicated as part of the um, the financial information that's given? Do we communicate publicly on the conversion rates that are used? Um, it's not something that I've seen um, communicated publicly. I have to say. No. No, yeah, I, one of my other roles is I'm a 
schematry for a number of DB schemes. So I get to, to advise trustees about those conversion rates. Um, if I understood your question rightly, it was like, how do you determine the amount of the, the, the DB transfer value? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, the rules, the rules, the, the pension rules which we play by say mm -hmm. that needs to represent the expected cost to the scheme. Yeah. And that's what mm -hmm. the trustees can consider uh, paying. And the actuary advises how much you know, what assumptions should be used for for that calculation. Now, because it's the expected cost to the scheme, it will vary wildly from scheme to scheme. Yeah. And it will also very much depend on the, the features of the benefits. If, if you have pension increases with fixed five increases mm -hmm. every year, that will be a much more valuable benefit. So there's a wide range. And um, there's been a long debate about can we bring some consistency into, her, into how actuaries calculate these numbers. Um, the Institute of Actuaries had a, a big navel gazing at that problem about 10 years ago and went full circle and said, no, we have to leave it down to every single scheme. So there will be wide, wide variations mm -hmm. between you know, the, the valuation of somebody's pension yeah. in one scheme compared yeah. to another yeah. because there'll be different advice, different yeah. assumptions and different scheme circumstances. Yeah. Um, and of course, if the scheme doesn't have sufficient money to pay all the transfer values for everybody in full, mm -hmm. The trustees can, if they yeah. want to, consider reducing them reducing. Um, if they have a worry that ultimately the employer is not going to be able to stand behind um, the, the total cost. So it's, mm. I, I don't see consistency in, in that transfer value figure ever mm -hmm. coming into the market, really. Okay. So what's the advice? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what's my advice? <laughs> um, Perhaps not the right word, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we go my guidance. guidance. What's my guidance? <laughs> yeah, I've got the FCA sat next to me here, so I, I need to be very careful. Um, I think it's what's your risk profile. You know, it's what's what's your risk profile. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, right now, yeah. if uh, if you look at transfer values, a lot of them are, are linked to gilt yields. Gilt yields are at historic lows. That means transfer values are, are at historic highs. So. I think if you look at um, a transfer value, you probably need to generate a return of 3 or 4% in the long term yeah. Yeah. if you're at, at the point of retirement to stand a good chance of actually getting more money. But, you know, what's the cost of the guarantee? Mm. You know, the pension scheme does mm. give you a, a pretty strong guarantee that that money will be there for you for the rest of your life. So yeah. I'm not surprised that there's a big spike mm. in the interest in yeah. taking transfer yeah. values. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there is a logjam in the, in, the, in the process that... Mm. Uh, the FCA quite rightly said that there needs to be safeguards. Mm -hmm. People can't just yeah. take the money. They must go and take financial yeah. advice yeah. if the transfer value is more than 30,000. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem is a lot of uh, IFAs, independent <coughs> financial advisors, yeah. are afraid of giving yeah. advice which takes into account maybe some softer mm -hmm. non-financial mm -hmm. um, uh, aspects of why people might want to transfer. Yeah. And they, uh, and if they don't feel that they can give a positive recommendation to transfer, then the, the client, if he still wants to transfer, is then classified as an insistent client. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many IFAs then feel uncomfortable even processing the transfer for insistent clients because of potential liability claims down the line, and many providers won't accept mm -hmm. it yeah. unless there's a positive recommendation. So there is a bit of an advice logjam at the minute, which the FCA is looking yeah, at, yeah, yeah. Alex. Um, yeah. So I think it's going to take a while for these these pension freedoms really to open up yeah. Yeah. To, to, to people wanting to transfer out from DB schemes um, for you know, reasons which are you know, a, a bit softer than just the hard, the real hard financial um, kind of comparisons. Alex, do you want to come back on what the FCA are doing in particular? Yeah, I mean, a first, first point of clarification. Despite it being a, a very good policy, the, uh, <laughs> the requirement to have advice for, for more than 30,000 is, of course, a government policy rather than an FCA policy, <laughs> um, just for clarification there. Um, and I think, you know, I think the, the insistent customer's point is, is quite important. Um, the FCA did release some guidance earlier in the year on how, how advisors should treat insistent customers. And, you know, the first point about advice on, for insistent customers is give suitable advice. Mm -hmm. So make sure the actual your advice is correct. And, and then after that, it's make sure the customer understands the risks of the decisions you're taking. And there's only the third thing is, is just simply then document all that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we, we've said that the Financial Ombudsman Service has come out in support of our guidance. And, and we did a survey over the summer to find out what, what firms were doing mm -hmm. uh, when they saw insistent customers coming towards them. And, and largely the answer is they wouldn't take insistent customers. 
but equally, uh, they didn't ask advisors if their client was insistent. Um, so in practice, if, if an advisor is prepared to act on behalf of an insistent client, mm -hmm. then most providers will actually take that business. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I think there is a route for, for customers. I think it, you know, there, there is clearly some dissatisfaction with the idea that, that you have to get financial advice mm -hmm. for people who may well have taken some very clear decision that they want their money. Yeah. And so I think that that challenge is there, and I think then the challenge falls down of how can you make sure that there's more advice available at affordable levels in the type of advice is suitable for the, for the client's needs. Mm -hmm. And again, that, that comes back to that review that we're doing jointly with Treasury to see whether there's other ways to do that. Um, but, but clearly this is a very difficult point because the fact is consumers are looking to give up very valuable benefits. And I think it's absolutely essential that we're all, we're all sure that they understand that and they understand what they're doing before they make choices mm -hmm. that yeah. might not be in their interests. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, more hands this time. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie. Uh, how do you see future developments in this area? How do you see... Uh, how, how, Stephanie Hawthorne, Pensions World. How do you see future developments in this area? Well, how would you see the next couple of years pan out in following freedom and choice? Jamie, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so, so I think some of it uh, we, we covered before where, you know, particularly from the guidance point of view, we, we'd expect the guidance to, to change and be much more tailored to the individual customer. I think as things like the secondary annuities market come into play in 2017, I think that will also uh, impact it. I think some of the, the discussion we were having earlier about D and transfer values I think that there's a link there to that secondary market mm -hmm. and and I think that in itself is going to be, you know, present challenges for those providing guidance as well as schemes and mm -hmm. um, trying to protect members uh, from making a decision they may later regret so uh, I think there's inherent risk in all of those things uh, but yeah it's a, it is about how you educate customers uh, and um, you know, talk to them in a language that makes it it's simple, but that they understand the risk, and I think we're going to have to work uh, across the industry to to agree some you know, language that uh, is common across uh, yeah. providers yeah. and uh, guidance givers uh, and regulators, so yeah. that you know, when customers need to talk to us about this thing, uh, they they understand that we're talking about the the, the same thing for everybody. Um, so I think that's going to be uh, you know, some of the things that we're going to have to really focus quite hard on uh, across the piece. And I, you know, I won't repeat the comments I made earlier about the um, education continuum because I think that applies to, to, to that question. But, but additionally, I think there's, um, we should see the defined benefit scheme starting to improve their game in this area to be um, more, um, more up to speed um, and more representative of the defined contribution, particularly in the master trust market, the big DC players, they are much more advanced than an awful lot of the DB schemes are in this area. And I think the DB schemes can learn a lot from that. Um, I think the biggest challenge is the smaller DB schemes, where everything we're talking about is cost, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and yeah. that cost factor is a significant mm -hmm. yeah. issue. Um, and I think that's the area where we'll, we'll see the least mm -hmm. progress and pace of progress. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just hope that the, the economies <coughs> and the efficiencies that come through the rest of the market developing mm -hmm they'll be able to, to, to piggyback off and benefit from in due course. Yeah, great. Okay. Further, yes, gentleman in the striped shirt. Hi, it's uh, Colin Richardson here, PTL. If it may be cheeky to ask two questions. Firstly, um, I think it was last night or this morning, there was some report, there's so many reports every day, this one suggesting that only 10% of people retiring and considering options were using pensions-wise. I don't know if the panel think that is is true whether that research was true and and, and jamie if i may be so cheeky what do you think of that <laughs> um and secondly there was a, a talk yesterday someone claiming that the fca were very much in favor of um robo advice as one of the ways around this cost of advice conundrum uh, i don't know if the fca truly are in favor of that or any, any comments on that okay I right, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll probably start if I may. First. So, yeah, I, saw, I heard three questions. Okay, okay well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll answer the ones I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 
<laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, what we have seen so far is that we've delivered over 20,000 appointments um, uh, over the phone and face-to-face, -face, and over 1.5 million people have accessed information on the PensionsWise website. Um, the point I'd also like to make is that PensionWise isn't the only player in the market. Um, there are um, commercial providers of guidance uh, operating and customers are also accessing financial advice. So um, I, I don't think it's appropriate to just assume that PensionWise is the only answer for a customer getting the information they need uh, to, to make the next decision. Um, I, obviously, I think we're quite an important player in that space, um, but we're not the only one. Um, and what there hasn't been yet is any numbers that tell us, actually, if you total up, all of the different options, you know, are, are we roughly there? Um, uh, our minister at the select committee uh, a few weeks ago made it very clear she felt everyone were getting uh, was getting the advice that they required. So obviously I'm going to agree with that. Uh, <laughs> and you so, keep a job. <laughs> and yeah. I keep my job, yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, so I, I, it feels like we're, we're doing okay. Um, would we like to reach more customers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why, why wouldn't we? And certainly the, the work that we're doing through our national marketing and advertising campaign is all about making sure that customers Customers can find us when uh, they need to, um, but the evidence does show that you know, we, we are getting there. And when they are using our services and the services of others, that um, uh, th that they're getting the support that they need. Good, Alex, robo advice. Yeah, robo advice. <laughs> yes, um, are, are the FCA in in favour of it? Um, we're in favour of consumers getting the support they need. Um, <laughs> Now, um, there's a variety of different ways people can receive advice. Um, even if, if you look at sort of the concept of, of robo-advice, and we held a, a robo-advice week the other week at the FCA, um, there are a variety of different models and different extents to which people are using online tools, either to provide the whole advice, part of the advice, or support of it. Um, and, I, and I guess as long as consumers are clear about the service they're getting uh, and the types of ways that they're able to interact, I think that can only be positive to actually get more people access to tools that they actually find useful. Um, I think you know a core part of this, and we, we see a lot with the, with the sort of the need for compulsory advice for pension transfers, uh, or, or I don't see that's necessarily the best place for it. But I think that uh, there is a lot of concern over the cost of financial advice, and I think that's that's seen as one of the big reasons that many consumers don't access advice. And I think there are others. I'm not uh, dismissing other reasons, but but I think if if the market can develop a greater sort of variety of different advice models and different ways of meeting people's needs, then I think that has to be positive for customers. And certainly, you know, some of the, the models that I've seen have been really positive and really sort of add, add value. I so said that, that doesn't always mean that they're delivered without face-to-face -face advice alongside it. So I think there, there is a sort of mixed world of models of advice, of which I do think that robo-advice is a key way in which in future we might actually get consumers the sort of support they need. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, take another one from the room, and then I do have I do have a live live question, so we will we'll use every avenue. Gentleman at the back. Uh, hi, uh, Stephen Budge uh, from Mercer, um, and thank you for for all the comments. They've been been uh, very interesting. Um, maybe a comment or question for Anne, if I uh, may. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered default retirement for your members, as in maybe having a selecting a preferred drawdown provider or supporting in that way? And more broadly, um, if there is no requirement for members to receive advice, as there is for DB, mm -hmm. um, do you think that trustees will be expected to come up with a default, or what would look like a default retirement mm -hmm. for their members? Um, and just would be, would be interested in your opinion. Um, well, in terms of the, the Warburton's plan, we have um, a, a scheme, normal retirement age, link, link with the plan. Um, but members go through a process when they join the plan where they decide on what their selected retirement age is. I think in terms of um, having a, a drawdown product on the platform, certainly the trustees have discussed this and um, like a lot of trustees at the moment are, are kind of steering away from that. I think it's having that responsibility for those funds once members have, have, have gone and and retire and it, it puts a lot of extra responsibility on the trustees but I think you know this is a whole new world now and I think you know it's it what's what is now will might be different in a few years time and I think it it is just waiting yeah that actually does lead on quite nicely to the the question that um, has been presented uh, by Ben Williams who actually works for AHC um, who asks, given the new pension freedoms, do you think that lifestyle switching is no longer appropriate as a default option? 
who are on the panel could yeah, answer. Yeah, I mean, it, interestingly, this, this was actually one of the parts of our recent consultation yeah. that we've just published, that responses are due by January, should anyone wish to respond. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, we, we put the question out to, to firms, you know, what should we be doing going forward? And it's certainly that we've had a lot of firms contacting us as the regulator and saying to us, what should we do? Yeah. Uh, you know, we've had all this lifestyling, yeah. it's putting people into low risk assets, you know, what should we do in the future? And I don't think there is an easy answer to this, because it does in, in, in need consumers to be engaged and start thinking early about where they're intending to go. So, uh, you know, we've asked for views on that. I don't think we have the answer. We're certainly looking for, for ideas and answers that may come in on that. Do you have any views on target date funds? Uh, again, you know, I think we'd, we'd look for all of that. Uh, you, know, I, you know, certainly if, if I look at our research that we recently, recently did over the summer, and, and what we found was we're, with people with smaller pots of less than 30,000, mm -hmm. predominantly they were cashing out. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's um, what we found. And, and for those above 50,000, they were going into drawdown. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't, you know, that, that is not a clean picture. Yeah. So okay. how, do you, how do you find some way of making sure the customer's in the right I investment mix given the type of decisions they're going to take? Yeah. And I think that's really difficult. And I think it needs, it needs people from the industry to come together and actually share knowledge, share experience, and try and actually come up with some good answers. Because I don't think we've got them at the moment. Yeah, I mean, what we've done at Warburton's, we've introduced a new default fund, which is kind of been designed around the member profile in what we expect that typical member to, to do with their pot. But we've also introduced the three alternative life cycles which target pension, um, drawdown and cash. And three year, so up to three years out that the funds are, are exactly the same and then they target different funds depending which avenue they feel they want to go down. And that's very much around the engagement roadmap that we've got. And speaking to people five years out and talking to them about these options and considerations and we'll be supporting that by communications to the member as they approach that three years to make sure they start thinking about where they might want to be invested. Great. Nikki, how do you think trustees have risen to, to this particular challenge and uh, has trustee behaviour started to change in your experience? Um, I, I do think it depends on the size of the fund, yeah. um, and the, as I said before, I think the biggest challenge is in the smaller defined benefit funds, where, um, you know, frankly, the debate is, is still about how are we going to fund this, how are we going to actually support um, the membership through these, um, these extra decisions, can we? And I think that, you know, the biggest risk actually isn't one around financial advice, it's around not doing anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, in the in the larger funds, there is there is an awful lot of debate, an awful lot of dialogue. I, I mean, uh, one of the positive byproducts is there is uh, I'm seeing even more dialogue between trustees and sponsor, which can only be good. Um, uh, are we seeing a lot of action yet? No, there's still quite yeah, a lot of I wait agree. and see. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. generally the trustees are still being quite cautious about it. It's early days. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Peter, same experience you're seeing. Yes, I mean, from the financial education point of view, a lot of our clients are, um, historically, they've been looking to us to come up with some content ideas as to what we can talk to staff about. We run a number of different programs, some for people just joining, some for people every year, and then some for people at retirement. Um, I have to say, pensions, freedoms, for people not at retirement is just... You know, what we say is, do you know what, you're just going to have more options, don't worry yeah, about it, but it's yeah. just a bigger yeah. incentive now for people to mm -hmm. save. So we have yeah. seen a huge engagement right across yeah. the piece now that yeah. people can just access their money, they're not going to be forced to buy an annuity. Um, but on the point about, you know, what default uh, yeah. investment fund should I go for? Yeah. Should I go for your, and I like your ABC, you know, your annuity <laughs> bit by bit, or cash, yeah. I yeah. might well pinch that. If that's <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got trademark, can't yeah. do that. <laughs> You've um, ABC, that's very good. But I like that. So <laughs> we do see a lot of, uh, a, a lot of pension um, DC funds are introducing multiple default strategies. And we're now uh, you know, being asked to, to be pushed forward into that space of helping people understand what those options are and make a decision. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you say, it's only three years out from retirement. So if I'm talking to somebody who's aged 25, 30, mm -hmm. I just say, just save the money because yeah, you're going to yeah. have some good options. And, and I don't know what the market will look like, obviously, yeah. when these guys get to retirement. 
um, but it is writing the the yeah. the, 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 the content right, for uh, yeah. for future um, financial education sessions which we're running. Yeah, we've got to try and harness this moment in time though that you just referred to, haven't we? Because mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the reality is people haven't engaged during the accumulation yeah, period. Yeah, what yeah. makes us think mm -hmm. they're going to be any different during decumulation? Yeah. And yeah. we've got this opportunity that we need to try to harness and and yeah. and leverage. Yeah. One of the earlier cr questions was about what future developments we see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, we talked about robo-advice and robo-guidance mm -hmm. and things like that. I do think techno technology will have a, a big, a big um, yeah. role to play. Yeah. I think investment has a big role to play as well. Mm -hmm. um, annuity was the, the easy default solution yeah. Yeah. for people at retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think um, drawdown is the long-term default solution. I think it's very attractive and mm -hmm. probably, well, we're young, particularly people in this audience who are yeah. probably quite financially literate. The idea of managing your own fund isn't quite as daunting as, yeah. as we recognize it is for, for some other people. <coughs> um, I mean, just a silly example, a friend of mine told me a story, you know, he invited his dad across for, for tea one day, so you know, Thursday next week, and his dad just said, uh, oh, Thursday, that's green bin day. <laughs> now the point about that story is, you know, on th that means on Thursday all he could think about was I need to put the green bin out. How, are we really expecting these yeah. people to be able to say, right, well, am I invested in the right fund? How long am I going to live? How much can I afford to yeah. draw down? Yeah. So we do need an annuity mm. plus product. Mm. I know, mm. you know, defined ambition, CDC, these kind of things. When when Mr. Webb was uh, around, where we're beginning to to gain a bit of momentum and have gone quiet. But I think we do need some sort of collective shared risk investment fund, which yeah. people can, maybe when they're 75, they can just say, right, I'm going to put it in there, and it's going to give them an annuity plus type income, because mm -hmm. people are looking for incomes. So I, I do see that as a development in the, uh, the investment front in, in, in the coming years. And one of the things that it, it strikes me is, is new with pension freedoms is we're, we're moving from a world where people were asked to make decisions at retirement, and then pretty much there were no further decisions to be made. But now we're expecting people, if they go for things like, like drawdown, to actually make decisions through retirement. Yeah. Whose responsibility should it be to help those people make those, those sorts of decisions? I mean, does pension-wise well, continue to be a yeah, pensioner? Yeah. So, so I think mm -hmm. you know, whether we like it or not, customers are going to come and knock on our door and expect mm -hmm. us to, to be able to provide help and support as, as the years go by. Uh, and you know, the, one of the things that freedoms give them is the ability to chop and change mm -hmm. it yeah. at later yeah. dates. And, uh, and I think every time they're reaching mm -hmm. one of those points where they think they might yeah, need to do something points. different, um, that, you know, they are going to come and, and, and see us. And so you know, we're going to have to be more flexible in, in how we approach uh, those customers. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a definite role for us to play and yeah. it's you know, how we continue to develop it to, to meet that need. Yeah, mm. excellent. Um, we've got another five minutes. Are there any sort of last questions from the the audience before I ask the panel? Can I just can I just uh, go to the gentleman behind you first, and then and then I'll and then I'll come to come to you. Thank you. Industry, we forget about the fact that the majority of our members are going to have small pots, you know, the 30 to 50k pot. And at that point, most of them see, oh, well, that'll give me next to no income, therefore I'll take this cash. Mm -hmm. That appears to me to be uh, what's happening at the moment. <clears throat> now, what we forget, what I think we should, Peter particularly, should be educating people on, is that it depends on your income. If I'm low paid and get, let's say, 18k a year, uh, that small pot's going to give me a thousand a year. You say, oh, that's not very good. However, don't forget that this guy's going to have 6,000 from the government plus his thousand. He, all of a sudden, his replacement rate is pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm on a higher, you know, if I'm getting 50k a year, that thousand is worth less to me than it is to the, mm -hmm. the low paid person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an aspect that we, we tend not to address. It's mm -hmm. income compared to what you're being used to. Yeah. It's yeah, something that we don't think about. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I'd say it's something we think about every day in PensureMise, yeah. and, and particularly um, you know, where we are providing guidance to customers who 
uh, are, are on benefits on very low incomes but but have these pots perhaps from previous employment or whatever um, you know we, we spend a lot of time and care with those individuals to understand the impact of making that kind of decision because frankly it will remove access to a whole range of state support by taking that option so so we do engage with that uh, every day with, with our customers um, uh, but uh, it's, it's doing that in a way that uh, enables people to understand that risk, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The gentleman just said, do you still have a, have a question? We'll take this as the, the last question from the floor. My concern about that move, won't it destabilise the strategy of this, some of the local authorities who have laid up that have to recover the shortfall within 10 or 15 years? And if there's a massive withdrawal of the cash from those funds, want to be able to destabilize or force them to close or to increase this contribution by the members. Can I have a crack at that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, uh, forgive me for kind of paraphrasing the question, but is the concern that if there's lots of transfers out from funds that might destabilize the investment strategy in a nutshell? Um, again, I, I, I hear that as, a, a, or I heard that as a potential risk of the pension freedoms that um, all of these uh, mass transfers out of funds might destabilise the, uh, the the investment strategy. Obviously, one of the things which the government did was they said there's no transfers from any of the unfunded public sector schemes are going to be allowed. So there was a ban on those, um, and I, I, I think that kind of echoes part of the, you know there's going to, might be a run on the bank and that that bank hasn't got any money in. I think for funded DB schemes, though, um, in my experience the real engagement of a transfer value comes at the point of retirement. Mm. Um, I, I've seen a number of sort of the enhanced transfer value exercises in the past, and talking to IFAs who've run those transfer value exercises, they tell me that trying to get the, the younger people to engage is a much harder job than the older people. You know, if you're saying to a 40-year-old, hey, take a transfer value because there's a chance you might get more benefit, um, but there's a chance there's not, and we can't, you won't really know for 20 years. That's not a really engaging story. But if it's somebody at the brink of retirement who can make a real comparison, um, then I, I think that's where the engagement is. Now, the reason I say that is I don't see a massive run on the bank happening on the, the transfer um, activity. And therefore, I don't think it's going to be a major investment consideration for yeah. pension schemes. You've got to remember, at retirement, people can commute a quarter of their pension broadly mm -hmm. for cash anyway. So we see that happening a quarter. The fact that a few members will actually go up and effectively you know, take a 100% cash option uh, is not going to be a material implication for, for funded pension funds yeah. uh, from an investment uh, point of view. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're about out of time. Um, just um, for a bit of fun more than anything, we do have a voting question. Um, which Philip will put on the screen. So just interested in who you think have been the main winners from the introduction of pension freedoms. Um, so on your uh, conference apps, those of you who've, uh, who've downloaded the app, if you could give your view as to whether you think it's one individuals, two pension providers, three the government, four IFAs or five the infamous Lamborghini salesman, <laughs> Um, that will be interesting for us to, uh, to just get your view. And while you're doing that, and before we see the results, I would just like to thank the panel, um, Peter, Alex, Nikki, Jamie and Anne, for um, their extremely interesting insight uh, into this situation. Um, and if you could we could thank them in the, the usual way, and then we'll see the results. <laughs> so, Philip, right. We have the results there. Government. Um, so the big, win the big winner is the government. Do I get a bonus for that? And the poor old Lamborghini salesman, they've burned. Uh, yeah, nine and a half percent if I read that to right. Oh, we're changing all the time. Oh. Pe people changing their votes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so definitely the, uh, the government is the, uh, is the standout sort of winner there. So. Uh, we are now out of time, so thank you very much for, for attending. We know you had a choice, so we're grateful that you came to spend the last hour with us. Um, and have a great conference, uh, the rest of you, the rest of the other two days. Thank you very much.